into Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. You know, it's a bright and sunny day out, Brian, so we should be talking about all positive things. But I want to talk a little about corn rootworms and, and how they're becoming resistant to some of the BT traits out there. That's kind of a little bit of a downer, but uh, we do have some good tips today that can help you manage that on I your farm. I don't know. Farm. I don't really see that as a downer, Darren. I see a whole bunch of dead rootworms after we handle them the way we're going to today. We'll, <laughs> well talk I, about it. Well, that will be a positive. That'll be fun. <laughs> We're also going to talk about dead weeds out in your spring wheat field and how you can control those very early on in the season. It's really important to have great weed control just as your crop is emerging. That's perhaps the most critical time for wheat production and even corn production when we talk about how to get the best yield. We've also got a really fun to talk about Weed of the Week because there's something unique about this plant that uh, once you know it, you will be able to identify this plant so easily on your farm and hopefully control it as well. But first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about soil erosion and phosphorus loss. Okay, now when we talk about soil erosion, I, I just want to get this out of the way right up front. Soil erosion has been so greatly reduced by today's farming practices in the United States, it's tremendous. You look at the drought that we had this last year, it was huge. It was widespread across our whole country. If that would have happened to us in the 1930s with the farming practices they had back then, we would have had another Dust Bowl last year, Brian, but yes. we didn't. The soil stayed in place because of things like conservation tillage, because of cover crops, because of the way our farming practices are being done today. And this reduction in erosion is especially important when we think about nutrients that could potentially leave our fields. Well, the nutrient we're most concerned about as farmers leaving the field is phosphorus, but also zinc and potassium. And the reason why phosphorus, zinc, and potassium are mentioned here is because they don't leach down through the ground as we get rain. So if a farmer is to apply phosphorus, potassium, and zinc on top of the ground, or let's take it a step further, if you in your lawn put phosphorus, potassium, or zinc right on that lawn, it's not going anywhere unless it gets absorbed. Well, it's gonna take a long time for your grass to absorb those nutrients, and what could happen is if you have a little bit of erosion, or let's just say you have a great big rain that comes along, that could wash some of those nutrients away, and that's a problem. And when it comes to these nutrients, what we're concerned about is when you see them show up in rivers, in streams, in lakes, these kind of places, because what we're worried about seeing is algae blooms. And when you see algae growth in these types of bodies of water, what the limiting factor normally is, is phosphorus. And as Brian mentioned, that's one that doesn't move down through our yeah. soil profile with rain. If some of that phosphorus runs off, that's where we see it. Now, I will, I will say this. There was a study done just a few years ago on the Mississippi River Basin, and they looked all the way up and down the Mississippi River at, at every farming county all the way along the way. They looked at how much phosphorus fertilizer farmers were applying versus how much phosphorus their crops were taking out of the ground and leaving the field with the grain. And they found out that farmers weren't even putting on as much phosphorus as what their crops were removing. Well, it wasn't just that study. You, you can look at USDA numbers and you can see what farmers are applying for corn, for soybeans, for wheat, all these different crops. And for the most part, they're not even applying as much as what they're removing. I agree with you. But here's the whole thing, Darren. A lot of farmers now have realized, hey, my phosphorus isn't going to move down with rain. And I'm worried about this because let's face it, we can never 100% prevent erosion. So what a lot of farmers are starting to do is deep inject their phosphorus or at least uh, get that down at two, three inches in the ground so then you don't have as much worry. If that phosphorus is laid on top of the soil, like in a no-till situation and it's broadcast out there, then that's where the greatest risk is for loss. Well, you know, and you, you talk about that and you say no-till. Well, no-till is also one of the greatest things for stopping soil erosion. It when is. you're leaving the yep. root mass in place, when you're leaving the residue in place. So most of what's going on with no-till we think is fantastic and probably the best way to go. For guys in conventional tillage, what they say is, well, I'm broadcasting my nutrients on top, that's fine, but you know, I'm going to till that in six inches deep with my tillage tool. Well, really, you're only moving that nutrient down about two or three inches when you're tilling six inches deep. So we still have a lot of it really close to the surface. So we're not just saying, well, no-till's a bad guy or anything like that. All of our farming practices have to recognize that we need to place those nutrients deeper to be safer for our environment long-term, and also we can get more out of it on a dry year. So once again, 
farmers are dramatically reducing soil erosion, but they're never going to 100% prevent soil erosion. So whether you're a farmer or you're just a person with a lawn, we just encourage you, make sure you're careful with the phosphorus you're using, especially around lakes, rivers, and streams. One other thing you'll want to watch out for is our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? What's new for 2013? Challenge 2050. Challenge 2050 is a two component system consisting of a nutrient and a biological additive. This groundbreaking fertilizer contains mycorrhizal fungi which provide an extended transport system that allows water and nutrients to be delivered directly into the root. Challenge 2050 can increase yield and efficiency of your standard fertilizer program. Challenge 2050 is the future of fertilizer. Call TJ Technologies or your fertilizer dealer and get Challenge 2050 today. If you're a farmer or a rancher, I know you've worked darn hard at keeping that baby rolling. It's more than a balance sheet, it's a way of life. Hey, I'm Steve Azar and I wrote and recorded the song American Farmer. Do you know what the purpose of a farm estate plan is? It helps avoid or minimize federal estate taxes and it helps preserve your wealth and pass the family farm on to the next generation. Call the good people at Swenson's. They care and they can help. Today's Case IH equipment is packed with industry-leading technology, and Titan Machinery has the experts to make it perform to its maximum potential. We have a team of specialists and the entire Titan Machinery network to provide you with the expertise to keep up with today's advanced machines. Whether it be for your Case IH planters, sprayers, or precision farming equipment, our experts have the answers to get the most out of your equipment investment. Maximize your productivity with Titan Machinery, better solutions. Your equipment's ready. The seed's in the barn. You have a strategy to overcome the challenges you'll face and your crop protection products are pretty well locked in. But maybe you still haven't finalized your fertilizer plans. If not, visit agroliquid.com today. With products formulated for superior nutrient uptake, unsurpassed application flexibility, and proven by years of extensive research, this may be the season to take your yields to the next level using agriculture liquid fertilizers. For years, FarmLogic has been the easiest and most convenient way to keep up with your farming operations. Well, it just got better. Introducing FarmPad for your phone. You always have your phone with you, so entering records as they happen is as easy as a touch of a button. Chemical database, GPS, service records, and more. When you do it on the farm, save it on your phone and it's backed up forever. Call or visit FarmLogic.com for a free trial and find out why FarmLogic is the best decision tool for the farm. Early season weed control is super important, especially in grass crops like wheat. Well, and you say that, but a lot of guys say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? I, I, I control my grass, you know, oh, I don't know, and the wheat's up this big and I'm out spraying. Or for my wheat's going to choke out that grass because wheat is very vigorous early in the season and a lot of times it's a week or two before the foxtail gets started or wild oats so hopefully my weed will be strong enough to choke that out. I want to do what I can do to stop weeds and one thing you can certainly do in wheat for not very much money is control grasses. When we look at pre-emerge herbicides I really like prepare early for grass control in wheat and when it comes to broadleaves you're worried about resistant weeds like kochia across much of the country has been ALS resistant for many years but now we're finding it to be Roundup resistant in many areas as well. We want to take that thing out early also. You could use something like Sharpen for great broadleaf control. Okay, you can use Sharpen, but here's what's going to hold a lot of guys back. If you use a couple ounces of Sharpen, yes, you're going to get some good residual and some tremendous burn down, but Sharpen has no activity on grass and it's going to cost about 10 bucks an acre for two ounces. Whereas Prepare will cost less than $5 an acre if you use the reduced rate 0.2 ounces per acre. And yeah, you're not going to get perfect control out of Prepare, but at least you're going to have some activity on a few broad leaves, and you're going to have lots of activity on many of the grasses, including wild oats. I'm going to stick up for Sharpen because here's what a lot of guys are saying. Well, you know what? It's cold early, and if I'm going to get Roundup to work, I'm going to have to put on two quarts of Roundup in a lot well, of cases maybe, on those broad leaf weeds. are actually using I'm Roundup gonna, in I'm gonna, their spring wheat? Nobody's gonna, using Roundup. Roundup I'm going to cut back on that burn down on Roundup and I'm going to throw some dollars into Sharpen instead and I'll get a lot faster burn down and better burn down on some of those broadleaves, like especially the winter annuals. I can smoke them when I've got Sharpen in the mix because I can use a pretty strong rate. Now I'm also going to get some residual on things like kochia and you know what? Yeah, a lot of those grasses aren't going to start till later. 
And if I need to, I can put in a grass herbicide with my first application across the field. So there, there are different ways to look at it. If I had a big problem of winter annual yeah, broadleaves, I, yep. I think I'd go with the sharpen and hammer that stuff. Yeah, but let's keep in mind, prepare does have burn down activity as well. And if you went roundup and prepare, you do a pretty decent job. No. Also, I would say with the sharpen, you got to make sure you don't just use sharpen and roundup. You need methylated seed oil together with I it. I agree with you on that 100%. Now, I, I would say this, prepare does have some broadleaf activity, but it is an ALS product. So you got to think about that too. Right. You know, it's an ALS and there are a number of ALS resistant weeds that I may be trying to kill. Right. Well, anyway, with Prepare, the reason why I do like to use it is because of the fact that it has activity on so many different weeds. And again, it's not going to be 100%, but I don't need it to be 100%. I might luck out and not have to spray post-emerge, but if I do have to spray post-emerge, I won't have so many weeds, I won't have lost yield already, and I've got a much wider window because I've got that pre-emerge herbicide out. I don't have to spray, you know, the second that I see some of those weeds there because, oh my gosh, it's a disaster. I've already got most of everything under control. One thing about Prepare 2 and, and many herbicides, you need to understand what's going on in your soil as to what kind of residual you're going to get. For example, with Prepare, it's an ALS herbicide and when you have a high pH soil, we do really good even with a cut rate uh, when we've got high pH soils. When we get to real acid soils like we've got in the Palouse out in the Pacific Northwest, we've got to use a little stronger rate to get that same activity. So. By the same token, you say, Zero well, point what if three I'm, ounces for a cost yeah. of around seven bucks? Yeah, but what if I'm using that full rate in this high pH ground? What are my chances I could ding the crop a little well, bit? Well, you could, and that's the reason why we don't recommend 0 0.3 ounces very often if you're unsure of what your soil pH is. So the drawback is, yes, you're not going to have as much activity if, let's say, you did have a low pH and you went 0 0.2 ounces, but it's not the end of the world. So I guess I'd just be on the cautious side. If you don't know what your pH is, first of all, have your soil tested. It's not tough to test this and it's pretty inexpensive. If your pH is above 7 and especially above 7.5, we absolutely recommend cutting the rate to 0 0.2 ounces. And again, the cost is under 5 bucks an acre. Well, there's one other product that I want to mention. Brian probably doesn't even want to talk any more about this, but, but there's a product called Zidwa that we're using in corn and soybeans that they're hoping to get a wheat label down the road here in a couple of years. If they do, that's a product that does some grass and some broadleaf activity pre-emerge that that would have soil residual. Well, we're kind of excited about that one. We'll watch it in the university trials and we'll be trying some uh, you yeah, know, but the reason why we're, we're some the, the reason why we're so country. the reason why we're so excited about it though is because it's a totally different mode of action from what we've been using in wheat. It's the same chemical family as Harness, Surpass, Outlook, and Dual in corn, but. In wheat, we're not using any of those products. So if we could get a different mode of action down, as opposed to prepare as an ALS herbicide. So we've been using ALSs in the past. Sharpen is different. I mean, that's nice. Well, you look PPL, at all the grass right. control in wheat, and we're primarily looking at either an ALS product or an ACCA. So if we've got a group right, 15 it. like Zidua that we can bring in, that would sure be nice to mix things up a little bit, especially as we're seeing some resistance with some of the tough grass weeds across the country. Well, once again, we encourage you to take a look at pre-emerge herbicides in wheat. I know you may not have used one before, but it's very helpful, especially if you want to get top yields on your farm. Well, you can't get top yields if you don't have great weed control. We'll show you how to control this tough weed coming up later in the show. Wake up. Breakfast is served. Your roots crave pee. Most of your applied pee gets tied up in the soil, a natural phenomenon known as phosphorus fixation. Fix the problem with a Veil Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. A Veil makes more pea available to your roots. Here, here, and here. Increasing pea availability can lead to increased pea uptake in the plant. That's more pea, more pea, and more pea. More phosphorus for your crop can be more results in your bin. An average of 9.9 .9 bushels per acre of corn. Breakfast is served. Supercharge your pea with a Veil. If you bought a new tractor, combine, or semi in the last year, you probably noticed it came with an extra tank. That's the one you fill with diesel exhaust fluid. I'm Bruce Vollen with Vollen Oil. Our customers are asking about diesel exhaust fluid, and the general rule of thumb is for every three times you fill your diesel tank, you'll need to fill your DEF tank once. And yes, we deliver that too. For your free fuel or DEF quote, give us a call at 529-5458, or check us out online at vollenoil.com. Speed, strength, and efficiency make Capello corn heads a head above the rest. Built with polymer components that exceed industry standards, Capello corn heads continue to push the boundaries for maximizing grain retention while using less energy. Visit CapelloUSA.com and learn more about Capello's state-of-the-art chopping technology that cuts cleaner, allowing your horsepower to remain where it belongs, with your combine, so you can harvest faster in all weather conditions. 
Add to that an amazing folding feature and it's clear to see why Capello is ahead above the rest. What's new for 2013? Challenge 2050. Challenge 2050 is a two component system consisting of a nutrient and a biological additive. This groundbreaking fertilizer contains mycorrhizal fungi which provide an extended transport system that allows water and nutrients to be delivered directly into the root. Challenge 2050 can increase yield and efficiency of your standard fertilizer program. Challenge 2050 is the future of fertilizer. Call TJ Technologies or your fertilizer dealer and get Challenge 2050 today. There are more mouths to feed than ever before. What are farmers doing to meet the challenge? They're using agronomically designed equipment from Case IH. Our Quattrack technology, soil management, and planting systems are designed to foster a better growing environment that helps farmers maximize yield potential. And our deep understanding of agriculture is preparing them for the challenges ahead. Will you be ready? I'm ready. Go to CaseIH.com to learn more. best part about having wheat like this field here, Brian, is we don't have to worry about corn rootworms. <laughs> They're a terrible problem in corn, especially if you're in continuous corn. You know, though, we actually still do have to worry about corn rootworms. So we're going to start from the end and work our way back. Last summer, one of the steps you could have taken to reduce your rootworm issues this year was to kill any adult corn rootworm beetles that showed up. And you know, there are rootworm beetles now that will lay eggs in wheat fields. They'll lay eggs in soybean fields. And so if you see a whole bunch of corn rootworm beetles out in your wheat field or soybean field, you might just want to spray if you're going to be raising corn next year. Well, okay, you talk about spraying at the end of the season. Wait, I'm worried about... No, let's, no, we're going to go from back to, to the beginning, all oh, right? Boy. So now, we'll take, it, <laughs> take it a little bit earlier in the season. So if you're in soybeans and you have volunteer corn, that's a nice host for those rootworms. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to spray my volunteer corn herbicide when I'm going to go out the first trip on Roundup. I'm going to save it for the second trip. Well, that's fine. You can do that. But number one, you lost yield. And number two, you just provided a host for rootworms and they only need a host for about one month. And that's about how long you wait between spraying the first time in Roundup and the second time. So we always advise you to spray your volunteer corn first rather than last to prevent the rootworm problem. All right, Darren, now we can go to the beginning. Can we go back to planting time? Yeah, now we can go back to the beginning. Okay. Well, when you think about it, <laughs> planting time, and, and those things are important too, Brian. I agree with you 100%. They're very important. I think the most important thing, though, in your corn is to get out there at planting time and do something right because there's really no rescue treatment post-emerge for corn rootworms because they're going to be deep underneath the soil. So what we're looking at at planting time is we need to either make a decision of I'm going to ban some insecticide on top of the ground or I'm going to drop some in the furrow like in a T-band where I have some on top of the ground and some in the furrow or I'm just going to put it all in the furrow. And it really comes down to how your planter is set up and how you can apply corn rootworm well, insecticide, whether you're going to use a liquid product or a dry. Yeah, but there are some products that you can only use in furrow. Which method is the best for rootworm control? It doesn't make a lot of difference. I prefer a T-band if I've got a product that could be used that way, but it's not that big a deal. Just using some insecticide is really important. And if you have resistant rootworms, we strongly encourage you to use the full rate rather than a reduced rate. We're using a reduced rate on our farm when we're planting smart stacks corn, and I don't have a real big issue with that. But at some point, we're going to see resistance to the smart stacks trait as well, or two traits that are in there. And when that happens, then we've got to bump it to a full rate. Well, I find it interesting, Brent. I just started talking about the insecticide. I said nothing about the traits because I start my program, regardless of if I have smart stacks or not, thinking, how am I going to get insecticide on there? I want to have some. Here's why. When you look at how corn rootworms work, if you've got a BT trait, those rootworms have to find those roots and then take a bite out of the roots. And once they take the bite out of the roots, they're going to die. Now, if you have lots of corn rootworms, well, they're going to take a lot of bites out of that plant and you could still see it fall over in the field. And we've seen that with a number of guys across the upper Midwest where they have corn that falls over and they say, wait a minute, I had a trait there, whether it's one trait or two traits in the plant and I still fell over. Well, it could be just due to heavy, heavy pressure. The other thing that we are seeing is rootworms that are resistant. Now, the resistant rootworms so far have only been resistant to the single trait BT products. They haven't been resistant to something like Smart Stacks that has two different rootworm BTs in it. Okay, now one of the things he said there is you for sure want to use insecticide. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that because we have a real good idea in continuous corn if we're going to have 
a lot of rootworm pressure the next year if you just go out and scout your cornfields in the middle of the summertime. If you're seeing any rootworm beetles at all, you're gonna have some pressure next year. If you're seeing no rootworm beetles, you might not have any problem, Darren. I've never <sighs> seen that before. I haven't but... seen that. The other thing is we're talking about beetles here and they can fly, they can fly they several they miles. Yes, but they don't move real far. That's the nice thing about beetles. It's different than aphids or moths or something like that. Beetles don't move very far. Well, they aren't gonna move hundreds of miles, right. but there's, there's nothing saying if we had them in this field that they couldn't end up a mile down the road. Right. So you have to keep that in mind. If your neighbors are planting corn, you say, well, I'm not planting corn all that much or I'm only planting it every other year hey, you could still have an issue in your field. Okay, one last thing. Let's talk about which insecticides are the best. We prefer the dries. They're gonna be a little bit better than the liquid, but the liquid is easier to handle. And like with Capture LFR, it is significantly less expensive than the dry products. And some of these dry products are sold out already, like Force in Smart Boxes. You can't even get that if you wanted it. Use what's available. If you can get Capture LFR and run it right through your liquid starter system, that's an easy way to go for a lot of guys. They're already putting starter on, or they may be interested in putting that system on. It doesn't cost that much money to do, and they have programs to help you pay for the equipment if you want to get started. Okay, so once again, if you're worried about resistant rootworms on your farm, plant Smart Stacks corn, use insecticide, at planting time and then spray insecticide later in the season when you see adult corn rootworm and beetles. And don't forget to control volunteer corn in your soybean fields. Yep. That's a great way for rootworms to, to make it through your rotation and they don't have to survive for about a month on the roots. That's all time we have to talk about corn rootworms because we have a tough weed of the week to control. Can you identify this week's weed? The Weed of the Week is sponsored by the Enlist Weed Control System from Dow AgroSciences, a new herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate. You work to protect your farm's legacy and to keep it going. Introducing the Enlist Weed Control System, an advanced herbicide and trait system that will build on glyphosate for exceptional control of tough weeds. The next chapter begins. Our weed of the week is barnyard grass, and Darren, you were telling us a little earlier in the show, with this weed, there's one little thing that you've gotta know, what is it? It's not what the weed has, it's what it doesn't have. And what barnyard grass doesn't have is a ligule. Now with most grass weeds, when you take the leaf blade and you bend it back away from the stalk, you can kind of look right on the top of it and you can see that ligule right where it hooks up with the stem. Now what we don't have on barnyard grass is a ligule. The ligule is absent. And when we see that in our fields, this is about the only grass weed that we have on our farm ever that we don't see a ligule on. So barnyard grass is pretty easy to identify and it gets you looking for that very important plant part the ligule. Now Darren, it's easy to identify. I wish it was that easy to control. Well, it's a little more difficult <laughs> to control than most weeds and that's fine, Brian, because you know, if they're all simple like green foxtail is for us, well, it wouldn't be any fun. Well, so we, we gotta have and, some and weeds we, that are a little tougher. And we wouldn't have a job. We wouldn't have a TV <laughs> well, show. Well, Weed of the Week wouldn't easy. be nearly as interesting <laughs> if all the weeds were simple to kill. Okay, so here's what we want you to do. In soybeans, it's going to be relatively easy because soybeans are a broadleaf crop and this is a grass. Just start with Trefland, Sonalan, or Prowl, follow up with Select Max, bam, done. All right, let's well, that's, get to the tougher ones. That's wonderful, but here's <laughs> what I do. Now, when we talk about corn, you say it's tougher to kill in a grass crop. Yep. It's fine when we have options like Liberty and Roundup. So if you have corn that you can spray Liberty on or Roundup on, they really help out a lot because let's face it, accent wasn't that great on no. barnyard grass. And no. if we were gonna get it, I mean, it would have to be so small. Yeah, but so the, problem really is, like having that. the problem is Roundup resistant barnyard grass, then what? Well, then you're gonna have to spray Liberty. That's about your only or choice post-emerge. Yep. Yeah, you could do accent again. But again, you've gotta be out there when that stuff is an inch tall or less right. to be real effective. That's tough to do. So that's why it's important to have a really good pre-emerge herbicide down, like a full rate of harness surpass outlook or dual. Well, even in, even in Roundup Ready corn or Liberty Link corn, we really like putting a strong rate of a pre down. It, it's well worth it when you look at your return on investment. Okay, and wheat, we would suggest going with prepare down, follow with axial post-emerge. Those are probably the two best options. So when you're looking at grass in your field this year, look for that ligule, and if you can't find one, chances are you have our Weed of the Week barnyard grass. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week, but stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. What are farmers doing to feed the planet? 
they're using Quadtrek technology, soil management, and planting systems from Case IH to foster a better growing environment that maximizes yield potential. Visit CaseIH.com to be ready. If you want top yields, it starts with managing last year's crop residue and building this year's seed bed. I'll explain in today's Iron Talk. There are many adjustments to make on the planter. On our farm, we've done some no-till, some conventional till, and quite a bit of strip till. As you move from one field to the next, there's a big difference in the amount of residue from last year's crop left with each of these tillage systems. Here's the goal of your planter's residue managers for each tillage system. In conventional tillage, you're just trying to push the root balls and residue out of the way. As long as you're doing that, you're in great shape. Just make sure you're not creating a trench for a seed bed. We saw that last spring, and for the guys who had it, many of them ended up replanting when heavy rains washed the seed away. In no-till, we typically see guys digging in a little deeper with the residue managers, especially if there's a crust or if they're in a heavy residue situation. That said, you don't want to move too much soil for fear of digging a trench, as we mentioned earlier. We're doing more strip tillage all the time on our farm, which certainly takes more time in the fall than the other tillage systems. The benefit is creating your seed bed on a nice berm in the fall. This way, in the spring, we're just sweeping the surface with our residue managers for any residue that may have blown over our strip since last fall. By properly setting your residue managers based on your tillage system and field conditions, you can achieve an even planting depth for all seeds in your field, giving you maximum yield potential on your farm. That's all for today's Iron Talk and now back to the show for lower cost higher production mandaco agri leads with versatility unmatched twister is the vertical tillage unit for no-till as well as conventional tillage twister's ease of maintenance is forgiving in rocks and has contour conformity equaling zero downtime our hydraulically adjusted coulter angles make residue management easier less costly spring or fall the mandaco twister vertical tillage unit is the new leader see your mandaco agri dealer visit northcountrymarketing.biz or call you expect a lot from this seed and as it grows through each stage of development agroculture liquid fertilizers is there feeding your crop exactly what it needs when it needs it so no matter how you fertilize no matter when agro liquid efficiently brings all the nutrients your crop needs for a great harvest from one kernel in the ground to 600 on the ear for better yields and better quality agroculture liquid fertilizers Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. The all new S Cube Commercial Tender is the only tender on the market with poly tanks, giving you the capability to haul seed, fertilizer, water, or liquid fertilizer. Each cube can hold 300 units of seed, 2,000 gallons of liquid, or 300 cubic feet of fertilizer. Options include full functioning wireless remote, stainless steel conveyors, and self contained hydraulics. Get yours today at Norwood Sales. That's all the time we have for today's show, but be sure to join us again next time for another Weed of the Week, Iron Talk, Farm Basics, and a whole lot more. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. No one cares more for the environment than family farmers who plan to pass their land down to their children. These same farmers are working to double yields over the next 15 to 20 years to feed the growing world. To learn how they plan to do it, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.